Welcome to Gateshead, the second largest settlement on the legendary River Tyne, located directly across the river from Newcastle. While often overshadowed by its big brother over the water, Gateshead is a town of many different faces, home to a range of riverside sites and surprising tales in the town centre. We'll make our way up to the town centre in a short while, but as we get going, let's just make it exactly clear that we're not quite in Gateshead yet. This side of the river is still Newcastle upon Tyne, but we can now make our way into Gateshead by way of what may well be its most iconic landmark, the Millennium Bridge. Opened in 2001, a few hundred yards down the river from the iconic Tyne Bridge, the Gateshead Millennium Bridge is a wonderful new way to take a view of the river, open to pedestrians and cyclists passing between Newcastle and Gateshead. But there's more to this bridge than simply connecting the two sides of the river. In fact, Gateshead's Millennium Bridge was a world first when it was built, as the first tilting bridge ever to be built on the planet. How and why exactly does the bridge tilt? Well, as we can see from this image of the tilting bridge in action, the footway of the Millennium Bridge pivots upwards, allowing boats passing along the River Tyne to make their way through. The action of the bridge tilt is often likened to a blinking eye, which has given rise to the affectionate nickname the Blinking Eye Bridge. One of the most iconic projects built in England at the turn of the millennium, Gateshead's famous bridge has brought another beautiful landmark to the spectacular quayside on the River Tyne. What's more, along with the swing bridge a little further down the river, the Millennium Bridge here provides a very easy way to walk between Gateshead and Newcastle, without the need to climb up onto the Windy Tyne Bridge. From here, we can see upstream towards the Tyne Bridge, with the Silver Sage concert venue on the left. However, if we spin around and look downstream, we'll see an older icon of the quayside landscape here, the towering old Baltic flour mills. Built over a decade and opened in 1950, the old mills were a huge presence on Tyneside, employing hundreds of people from both sides of the river. The flour mills were once even larger than what we see today, with the old flour silo before us, the last remaining part of the complex. The flour mills closed in 1982, but 20 years later in 2002, the old silo building was converted into the Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art, a grand new art centre that formed part of the regeneration of the quayside here at the turn of the millennium. As we now make our way off the bridge into Gateshead proper, the quayside has been at the centre of life on Tyneside for decades and was once one of the busiest points for industry in Britain in the 19th and early 20th centuries. While the Newcastle side of the river was the site of busy street markets, and today a bustling riverside promenade, Gateshead Quays were also teeming with industry, with a small shipbuilding operation taking place a little further upstream. In the mid to late 20th century, however, the decline of local industry saw the quayside become run down, but recent restoration projects have since made it a lovely place to be once again. Looking up at the eye-catching arch of the Millennium Bridge, Gateshead Keys here are today the place where many people congregate on warm summer days to gaze at the river, while the Baltic Art Centre, which also has an observation platform high up, is a popular visitor attraction that combines modern culture while impressively retaining the industrial heritage of this area. The Keys here are a little distanced from the very heart of Gateshead, however, which is located higher up on the banks of the Tyne Valley, and which we'll now begin walking towards. But as we say goodbye to the Millennium Bridge, we find ourselves looking up at the Sage, another spectacular modern landmark that has come to form an iconic part of the landscape here on Tyneside. Built in 2004, the Sage is a huge concert venue, which also offers courses on musical education to the people of the local area. Designed with a bulbous silver exterior, 
the sage stands tall on the gateshead side of the Tyne, always attracting the attention of people walking along the river over in Newcastle. If you've never ventured over to this side of the Tyne, you may not have noticed that Gateshead is home to HMS Calliope, a small division of the Royal Naval Reserve. The Naval Centre takes its name from the iconic old HMS Calliope ship, which famously emerged as the only ship to survive a devastating cyclone near Samoa in 1889, and which later went on to serve as a training ship for Naval Reservists at the Centre here on the Tyne, which was established in 1907. HMS Calliope sits in the shadow of the Sage, which looms over us atop a rather steep bank. At this point, the River Tyne runs through a very steep valley, with the city of Newcastle built up on its northern bank and Gateshead on its southern bank here. The elevation between the Quayside and Gateshead town centre is really quite extreme, with a rise of 230 feet, or 70 metres, between where we are now and the heart of the town, where we'll be ending our walk rather out of breath in about 20 minutes. It wasn't far from here, however, that the banks of the River Tyne were home to a Roman settlement. Famously, Newcastle was the site of the old Roman fort of Pons Aelius, which stood just south of Hadrian's Wall. Here in Gateshead, a small area along the riverbank near the modern-day Swing Bridge was the site of a civilian settlement, above which there may have been a small defensive fort, positioned high up on the banks of the Tyne Valley. The Romans had a significant presence across Tyneside, and Gateshead was where an old Roman road was built from the town of Chesterle Street to the south, and which terminated at the river's edge near here. The rudimentary Roman settlement of almost 2,000 years ago is worlds away from the view over the Tyne in Gateshead today. The Tyne Bridge, the river's most iconic crossing, now stands above roughly where the old Roman civilian village was located, connecting Gateshead with Newcastle. The bridge, completed in 1928, was actually inspired by the plans for the Sydney Harbour Bridge in Australia. However, as the bridge down under is quite a bit larger than the Tyne Bridge here, this bridge was actually completed a good four years before the one that inspired it. Once upon a time, the Gateshead side of the river directly beneath the Tyne Bridge was also home to one of the liveliest spots on the entire quayside. From 1984 until 2008, there was a huge steamship popularly known as the Tuxedo Princess, a massive floating nightclub that became a beloved local landmark. The boat was originally known as the Caledonian Princess, and was built as a car ferry linking Stranraer in Scotland with Larn in Northern Ireland. But when it became a nightclub in the 1980s, many of its facilities inside were converted for partying, including the building of a huge revolving dance floor that made use of the old turntable on the boat. There was a brief period when the Tuxedo Princess was moved from here to Glasgow, but it later returned and remained in situ until being removed in 2008, when it was towed downstream underneath the Millennium Bridge, which tilted upwards to allow it through. But ships on this part of the Tyne weren't always for wild nights out. At this point around the Tyne Bridge, there was once a small shipbuilding operation in Gateshead, from the early 19th century until the 1960s. Shipbuilding was one of the largest industries on Tyneside for decades, but Gateshead's hand in the industry was rather more humble, never quite reaching the scale of shipbuilding giants further downstream, near the mouth of the River Tyne. While it may not have been a giant of shipbuilding, Gateshead was still a bustling industrial centre throughout the Industrial Revolution, and in the centre of town, we'll see a few traces from that era. For now, we're heading away from the riverside underneath the road of the enormous Tyne Bridge. The bridge marks the main entry point to Gateshead from the north, at which point the road splits between spaghetti-like side roads and the main road that bypasses the very centre of town on its way down towards Durham. 
This area was once one of the most densely populated parts of Gateshead, and where you'll find one of the oldest buildings in town just a few feet away, the original Church of St Mary, thought to have first been built all the way back in the 12th century. The church's tower is a little more recent, built in 1720, while the church today has been restored as a local heritage centre. But throughout Gateshead's history, St Mary's has stood at one of the most important points in town. Now that we've climbed up from the riverside, the church stands near to the site where it's thought a small defensive Roman structure was built, overlooking the valley beneath. The site may also have been used in the Anglo-Saxon era as a small monastery, but there's no official evidence to confirm that. For most of its 900 years of existence, St Mary's was the only Anglican church in Gateshead, and as such, was arguably the most important building in the medieval town, as the only place for Anglican worship or marriage ceremonies. That remained the case until 1825, but St Mary's remained hugely important, and was once surrounded by a densely packed residential area, roughly where we're walking now. Until the 1930s, the spaghetti-like network of roads here was once the site of a large slum, which had developed over time as residents were living as close to the river and its industry as possible. The slum was cleared in the 1930s, however, and with that, this area of Gateshead lost many of its residents, and St Mary's lost its congregation, eventually closing for worship in 1979. The removal of the slums in this part of Gateshead near to the river has left the quayside and the town centre a little further up the valley banks rather disconnected, as the focus of the local economy has shifted away from industry by the river to the centre of Gateshead and to the town's sprawling suburbs to the south, east and west. We'll talk more about how this part of Gateshead ultimately declined over time, but as we cross the road that takes you off the Tyne Bridge, we're just a few steps away from an eye-catching old pub building. In front of us is The Central, one of the oldest pubs in Gateshead, built back in 1856. When it was originally constructed, the building served as a business premises for a local wine merchant, but found its way into its current trade in 1890, when it became a hotel. You'll notice the distinctive shape of The Central pub, built in a striking, tapered fashion that conjures up images of the triangular Flatiron building in New York City. The shape of the Central has always made it an especially identifiable landmark in Gateshead, affectionately nicknamed the Coffin by locals. One of a wide range of pubs that we'll see in Central Gateshead, the Central was also an important step forward for the town when it was built, as it was one of the first buildings to be constructed in the aftermath of an enormous, devastating fire that swept through Tyneside in 1854. As we've mentioned, the riverbanks in Gateshead were once teeming with industry, home to small wharfs for shipbuilders, warehouses storing all manner of products, and a large wool factory. In the early hours on the 6th of October 1854, the wool factory was discovered to be on fire, and within an hour, the entire building was up in flames. The intense heat from the blaze caused sulphur in a neighbouring warehouse to ignite too, which launched a spectacular purple-coloured blaze into the air over Gateshead. The fire continued to spread, causing a massive explosion in a warehouse so large that it was heard over 40 miles away in the seaside town of Hartlepool. Depicted in this illustration from the time, Flaming debris soon began to fly across Gateshead, and even over the river into Newcastle, causing widespread damage to buildings in both towns. Gateshead was the worst damaged by the fire, and along with as much as half a million pounds of damage done to the old town, 500 people were injured and 53 were killed. But here, just a bit further up away from the riverside, we find ourselves by another building that rose from the ashes of the Great Fire. Built in 1870, this is Gateshead's Old Town Hall, a grand Victorian building that also once housed the local court and police station and remained the headquarters of the Borough Council until 1987. Since then, the Old Town Hall has been used as a local cinema, 
a part of the sage, and various other things. But it's also notable for this wonderful clock tower that stands just outside. The clock was placed here in 1892, presented to the town by the local mayor on the occasion of his third election victory. It looks a little bit like a miniature Big Ben to me, and it stands as a wonderful little monument to the Victorian heyday of Gateshead's thriving town centre. As we've mentioned, owing to the fire of 1854 and the clearance of the slums that once existed nearby in the early 20th century, this part of Gateshead is a little sparse of major historic landmarks. Although beside the old town hall is the former Gateshead Dispensary of 1832, one of the few pre-fire buildings left in the town centre, as well as a row of imposing Edwardian buildings built at the turn of the 19th century. That includes the grand former Lloyds Bank building, which also stands on the site of the home of famed local author and artist Thomas Buick, who lived in a house here in Gateshead in the early 19th century, and who famously wrote and illustrated by wood engraving the book A History of British Birds, first published in 1797. At the time that Buick was living here, the centre of Gateshead was much closer to wild countryside than it is today. Throughout the 20th century, the town's population has swelled to over 120,000, but that doesn't mean you won't find any green spaces nearby. The expansive suburbs are home to some wonderful parks, most notably Saltwell Park, while a little further south of the town centre, you'll find a nationally famous symbol of Gateshead, the Angel of the North. Towering over the A1 road as it approaches Gateshead and Newcastle, the Angel of the North is a spectacular monument to England's northeast, built in 1998. At over 65 feet or 20 meters in height, the Angel of the North is also thought to be the largest statue of an angel in the entire world. But as we walk up West Street deep into the center of Gateshead now, we find ourselves by another modern art sculpture, known as Sports Day. Erected here in 1986, the statue was originally multicolored, but has since been repainted black. Sports Day is said to represent the famous Aesop's fable of the hare and the tortoise, a story which was famously illustrated by Thomas Buick during his time here in Gateshead. The statue stands in the middle of West Street, which was once one of the most bustling streets in all of Gateshead. Originally known as Back Street, in contrast to the High Street which runs parallel, West Street was once lined with old shops, pubs, and even Gateshead's old indoor market. However, pretty much all of those buildings have been removed over time, replaced by various stages of regeneration, the latest of which includes the newly refurbished Gateshead Interchange, the site of the town's bus and metro station, with the direct links under and over the Tyne to Newcastle. On the other side of West Street, meanwhile, is perhaps the most striking piece of regeneration in Gateshead's recent history. Today, this is the site of the Grand Trinity Square Shopping Centre, opened in 2013 on the site of an enormous old car park of the same name. The old Trinity Square car park was an unusually large landmark in the centre of Gateshead, but was also iconic for featuring in a classic British film, which we'll talk about in a little while. For now, we've come to the end of West Street, where we're looking across towards St Joseph's Catholic Church, which has stood here in the town centre since 1859. The church is one of a number of varying denominations that now exist across Gateshead, a town which has expanded greatly from the tightly packed settlement that existed around St Mary's back down by the river. As we've mentioned, industrial development, regeneration and the Great Fire of 1854 have all contributed to the old town of Gateshead being swept away over time. But this part of the town was once where you would have found a network of narrow medieval lanes and rows of timber houses, worlds away from the modern place that exists today. 
Many of Gateshead's late 20th century buildings admittedly aren't the prettiest in the world. But here on Jackson Street, we find the ornate old Gateshead Cooperative buildings, grand central headquarters for the local co-op that were built in 1925. Next door to the building of 1925 are more buildings that were used by the old Gateshead Co-op, although these offices are actually a little older, built around 1884, and now playing host to more of the town's shops, as well as the Tillystone, one of Gateshead's many pubs. The Tillystone takes its name from the Tilly and the Stone, two underground coal seams that were worked on at mines in nearby Dunstan. Of course, like the rest of Tyneside, coal mining was big business in Gateshead for centuries, with mines established here as long ago as the 14th century, and reaching dizzying heights by the time of the Industrial Revolution, with hundreds of coal pits located around the town. Coal mining actually gave its name to the original name for Jackson Street here, which was originally known as Collier's Chair. The name for the street was changed in the late 17th century and is thought to have been named after Henry Jackson, who worked for the wealthy Gerard family, which owned an estate here in Gateshead. A little further down at the end of Jackson Street, meanwhile, stands another pub, the Metropole, which takes its name from the old Metropole Hotel, the building which it now occupies. The hotel, built in the late 19th century, was actually part of the wider Metropole Theatre complex, later known as the Scala Theatre, which was home to a huge old auditorium for audiences to enjoy plays and films. Sadly, the theatre closed back in 1956, with the old auditorium demolished soon after, leaving only the old hotel section that we see today. This now brings us onto Gateshead's historic High Street, where we can see the old St Edmund's Church, which incorporates the oldest building in town. On the right, you can see the original building of the 13th century, which was originally built as a pilgrim's hospital. Much later on in the 19th century, it became a church and was expanded to cater to the growing population of Gateshead, and the original medieval building was thankfully retained and restored. The high street here was where markets were traditionally held in Gateshead, and the road was once the busiest place for trade and business in town, as it lay on the main route between Durham and Newcastle, possibly around the same area as the original Roman road through Gateshead. While many of the shops that once stood on the high street have since migrated into the town's central shopping centre, the road is still home to the Grey Nags Head, a traditional Victorian era pub that takes its name from the head of a grey horse, which isn't all too far away from the origins of Gateshead's own name. There are a number of theories for the origins of the name Gateshead, but the most widely accepted is that the town's name simply means Goat's Head, not referring to the head of a goat, but rather to a headland, or more likely this hill on the Tyne Valley, that many goats grazed on. Even so, many organisations around Gateshead still use the head of a goat as the symbol for the town but we're now walking into an area which was once the site of an old symbol of Gateshead, Trinity Square. While that's the name for the modern shopping centre of 2013 that we see today, until 2010, you would have seen this enormous car park right at the centre of Gateshead here. The Trinity Square car park was a behemoth that could be seen from across the Tyne, but it also became an icon of Gateshead and Tyneside after it appeared in the classic crime thriller Get Carter, starring Michael Caine. Locations across the northeast were used for the film, but Gateshead's old car park is arguably the most iconic location from the movie, so much so that many locals simply referred to the towering old car park as the Get Carter car park. Now standing before the huge halo sculpture in the shopping centre where the old car park once towered over Gateshead, we've come to the end of our walk in this fascinating Tyneside town. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you get the chance to explore Gateshead for yourself too.